On uh, October the 8th, two weeks ago, we completed the reading of the book of Job as, as we begin each assembly. And as, as we read, and as maybe you've studied as well in the past, there's, uh, there's several one-liners, some statements that Job makes. They all, of course, have to fit into a context. But serv- several rich passages uh, that give us insight. And the, the book of Job is unique in, in that it gives the amount of attention that it does to uh, one individual or to, to a few individuals, I guess I would say. Uh, we get a, a lot... Uh, out of the mind of Job and then out of his three friends we learn maybe about as much uh, about Satan as we do in any other single book and then of course we learn a lot about God from the book of Job as well and so it's it's so rich uh, that I wanted to just at least spend one lesson uh, reflecting on the book of Job and so we're just just going to look at a few of the uh, a few notes didn't try to come up with some uh, catchy title uh, but just some notes to look at from the book of Job. Let's start in chapter 1 in verse 8. First of all, I just want to go through and just hit a few, uh, notice a few verses, uh, and then we'll touch on a couple themes and conclude our our study. Job chapter 1 in verse 8, The Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job, that there is none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man, one who fears God and shuns evil. Uh, now, if we knew more about the time in which Job lived, that might tell us more about why was, why was he so notable? Why is it there weren't uh, several others like him? Uh, but this is, this is about all we know. Uh, we know about Job, at least at this point, he was well in health and in family and his work and his wealth. Uh, but were those things the key to Job being blameless and upright and fearing God and shunning evil. Well, Satan thought they were. Satan accused uh, Job uh, of these being the reasons for his faith and his devotion to God. But of course, Job knew better. And this is one lesson from this. We, we need to, to know that and know better. And so this teaches us the simple lesson of, of contentment. Philippians chapter 4, verse 11, even the Apostle Paul said that he had learned that in whatever state he was in, they were to be content. And he described those states as being uh, having much and having little and and everything in between. Look at Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 5. If we know that family and health and work and wealth are, are not the keys to our faith, are not the keys to the the most important things in this life, then we ought to be able to take the approach that is simply summarized here. Let your conduct be without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have. I can be content with my health, with my family, with my work, uh, with, with my wealth, whatever there is or there isn't. And being content doesn't mean I can't ever make a choice that changes that. Uh, Being content that I'm unmarried doesn't mean I can uh, can never then choose to marry. Being content with my job doesn't mean I could never take a different job. Being content with the the money I have doesn't mean I can't save. Of course that's not the meaning. But it means that I will seek first the kingdom of God when there's a change in my family or health or wealth or work. And it means that I'll be, I will equally seek the kingdom of God when there isn't a change in these areas of life or some others. And it certainly means that I will not sin in order to bring a change or to keep a change from coming in these or any areas of life. And so Job had all of these things. He was blameless, upright, uh, feared God, and shunned evil. But of course, as we read through the book, when he lost all these things... Uh, For the most part, that did not change. Look at chapter 1, and then verses 21 and 22. Another well-known statement of Job. Up to this point, his children were all killed in one day. Uh, All of his wealth was depleted by robbery. And then maybe uh, maybe also a a storm of some kind. And so as as he bears the weight of that news... In verses 21 and 22, he said, 
Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked shall I return there. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. If you if you'd like to highlight or underline or make a note somewhere, that last statement by Job is impressive. In some ways, he's saying the same thing. Of course, Solomon said it later. But what he says here, you could compare to Ecclesiastes 3, to everything there is a season, a time to be and a time for the other. And he goes through a link, lengthy list of that, like that. But I guess the difference is Solomon was teaching and Job was living through it. What would you rather do? Talk about some subject and well, sometimes life is going to be this way and sometimes it'll be that way. Or you're talking about it because you're in the middle of one of those. That's the difference in what Solomon wrote and what Job says here. And so here, without his wealth, without his work, without his children, uh, verse 22 tells us he's still blameless. He's still upright. He still fears God. He still shuns evil. Now, he makes a, a small mistake here in saying, well, the Lord has taken it away. Uh, he didn't have the peek behind the curtain that we do that's recorded earlier in that chapter of Satan's part of in all of this. And that, that's interesting. I don't recall Satan coming up. I, I could be wrong, but I don't recall Satan coming up in between Job or his three friends about the, the possible uh, source of all the problems that had arisen. But notice here that even though he makes this mistake and attributes the things that were taken away to the Lord, it doesn't change what he says. E even, if, even though his perception was God had done all of this, blessed be the name of the Lord. Go to chapter 13. And so now uh, the uh, things have gone from bad to worse. He's lost his, his health, not his mind. And so miserable in the ways that that, that is described. His friends have come and they've already done the best things, the, the best thing that they could for him. And the best help that they offered him was when they came and just didn't say anything. And then that got worse the more that they spoke. And so in chapter 13, verses 15 and 16, <clears throat> Though he slay me, yet will I trust in him. Even so, I, I will defend my own ways before him. He also shall be my salvation, for a hypocrite could not come before him. So now, having lost work and wealth and family and health, Job just adds to the list. And even if I lose my life, he's still working from that premise. The Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And this is really a repetition of that. Uh, he knew that, that death could be used by God. God could know how to handle death and use death. And so Job's faith in God and confidence in God is not dependent upon God rescuing from him from death. But even if He takes my life, He still is my salvation even in that. Go over to chapter 19. Chapter 19, verses 23 through 27. And so... His friends have some things to say, and he has some things to say here. He's, as is the case in most of these, he's defending his innocence. And so verses 23 and 24 are a little bit ironic since we are reading about his words from a book. He said, Oh, that my words were written. Oh, that they were inscribed in a book. That they were engraved on a rock with an iron pen and lead forever. For I know that my Redeemer lives. And he shall stand at last on the earth, and after my skin is destroyed, this I know, that in my flesh I shall see God. And so, again, he defends his innocence, but he believes that, uh, he, and is confident that him declaring his own innocence, that that's not the final word. He's not the judge. He has a Redeemer. And his confidence is that the Redeemer will also know that he is innocent. And he's confident enough of that that he says, after my skin is destroyed, I shall see God. If, if he were a hypocrite, he wouldn't be all that excited about the day expressing the confidence that I will see God. And so this, this reinforces the, at least the claims that he made. 
And this passage is also helpful because Job, he admits throughout this there are many things he does not know, and he'll admit that even, even more so at the end of this book. But in all the things that he sorts, is tries, tries to sort through that he doesn't know, he doesn't get away from what he does know. And of course, someone has written a hymn uh, taken from this verse. I, I know that my Redeemer lives, and I know that I will see Him with my own eyes. Go over to chapter 23. Job 23, verses 8 through 12. I'm sure I'm passing over some significant statements. These are just some that, that have caught my attention. Job 23, beginning in verse 8. Look, I go forward, but He is not there, and backward, but I cannot perceive Him. When He works on the left hand, I cannot behold Him. When He turns to the right, I cannot see Him. But He knows the way that I take. When He has tested me, I shall come forth as gold. My foot has held fast to His steps. I have kept His way and not turned aside. I have not departed from the commandment of His lips. I have treasured the words of His mouth more than my necessary food. In verses 8 and 9, again, Job is acknowledging his limitations, his shortcomings, that there are times he's admitting God is doing things and I can't see if He's in front of me, behind me, left or right. He does something and I, I can't pinpoint, well, oh, well, this is exactly what God did. God was here and there and His fingerprints are all over all of this. He can't trace every step of God. But then in verse 10, then he takes the other side of that and is comforted with the confidence that God can of me. He can trace my steps every step. And he's comforted that God sees all of that. It, again, that reinforces uh, his, his integrity, uh, that he's not ashamed for God to know what he does forward or backwards or to the left or to the right. He can't follow God every step. But he's not ashamed for God to follow him every step, every day, where he is, who, who knows where he is or who doesn't know where he is or what he's doing. He's not trying to cover his tracks. He's not trying to sneak around the corner. He, he knows God sees it. And he's comforted to know that God sees that. And then what he says of himself in verse 11, that I, I have held fast. And in verse 12, I've not departed from his, the commandment of his lips. This isn't pride or boasting. He's not claiming he's never sinned any time, any place, anywhere. But what he says of himself is what God said about him in chapter 1 and verse 8. He's, he's saying, I'm blameless, I'm upright, I fear God, and I, I, I shun evil. And so, again, that doesn't mean he has never sinned. It just means when he sins, he seeks God's help to remove his own blame and not trying to blame someone else or, or cover up what he's done. And then in verse 12, though we don't know exactly <clears throat> how God was speaking or, or uh, who God was speaking to, and again, not knowing exactly when Job lived, we don't know, well, there was this prophet or this priest uh, it was certainly. It seems it was before at least the time of the Israelite priesthood, but it's clear that in some way God had spoken at this time, and He knew the will of God, and He viewed God's words as something to be treasured. And then He says, I've treasured it even more than my necessary food. Think about some of the passages, maybe you can call a few off the top of your head, maybe not the citation, but the words of of God's Word being compared to food. Uh, Psalm 19.10, sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. Or what Jesus said when He was tempted, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Uh, one occasion in, in John chapter 4, I'll give you a minute if you want to turn and read this one with me. John chapter 4, when, when Jesus was talking to the woman at the well, the disciples had gone away during that period. One reason he was by himself was because they had gone into the city to, to get some food. So he was waiting, and then he spoke with the woman. Well, then as they returned, they brought some food back and encouraged Jesus to eat. And Jesus said in verse 32, 
I have food to eat of which you do not know. You, know, you can kind of picture this scene. They, they had gone to get some food, and so they kind of look at each Well, where, where did he get some food from? But notice verse 34, Jesus said to them, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. That's comparable, though, of course, Job is in a different place. Uh, that's comparable to, to what Job says, is uh, I, I value the words that God has given more, more than my daily meals. So take that comparison with me for a moment. Uh, how do you feel, and what are you thinking about before it's time to eat? Maybe you're at school and you're waiting for the lunch bell, or you're at work and waiting for your lunch break, uh, but you, you know it's coming. What, what are the things on your mind? when mealtime is approaching. And then how does that change as you're eating? And then how does that change after you're finished? And then compare that. Job says, I have treasured God's Word. Uh, what, are you, what are your thoughts? What are you thinking about when an occasion is coming to hear God's Word? And it, it might be like an occasion like tonight, but not just here. Not just when we assemble, but some private occasion with your family or in someone's home or just the time that, that you anticipate where you set aside uh, to read and to think about God's words. Uh, when, when it's been some time since you've done that and your appointed time is, is coming, what, what's your thoughts before you get to it? And then as you're doing it, what, what's your reaction to what you're doing? And then when you finish, what, what do you do when you've, when you're finished? Uh, when, when, you've, when you've had a great meal, what do you do when you finish? Well, you probably don't just throw the plate in the sink and go on about your day. You, you might just sit there for a minute and, oh man, that was good. Hey, great, great job. I'm going to leave a good tip here or, or thanks to whoever, whoever made it. When, when, it's, when, it was that, uh, when it was that good, then there's at least a few minutes after you're done that you value, you treasure what you just were given. And of course, God didn't intend for all food to taste the same, but He gave all food. And all of God's Word is not going to all strike us the same way mentally or emotionally. Uh, there are some verses that, wow, just can't get enough. Maybe Job, we'll look at that in a few minutes, you know, 38 to 41, where he challenges, God challenges Job with all he's done. That, that's an easy section to read and causes us to reflect on some of the things we sang a few minutes ago. But of course, there's other passages uh, that are just, you have to work a little harder to, to read through it, and you're tempted to just skip a couple chapters ahead. Or maybe it's not tough to read in the sense of the, uh, of the message, the understanding. But it's just not pleasant because it, it strikes our conscience. Well, regardless of the taste, regardless of the, our initial reaction to what we read, uh, it, it's, it's all the same, isn't it? And so Job says, uh, Job had learned to treasure the words that God had spoken. Uh, if, if David had read from the book of Job, maybe... Uh, that was part of his statement. Sweeter than honey and the honeycomb. In Job chapter 31, I'm not going to read, but here I'm just referencing the entire chapter. As God had said earlier that Job was blameless and upright and feared the Lord and shunned evil. In Job 31, again, as Job is debating his friends and disagreeing with their assessment of why he's suffering as he is, uh, again, this is not a chapter where he's boasting, but he's just trying to lay it out all out on the line and saying, here's what I know. And when I look at my life, here, here's what I think I've done. And if there's something other than that, tell me. But here's what a blameless, upright, God-fearing, evil shunning, as God described Job's life in chapter 1 and verse 8, here's what that kind of a life looks like in some reform. This, this can be useful uh, I've heard this compared to uh, Proverbs 31, uh, the chapter of the, the virtuous woman. And I've heard some people say Job 31 is a chapter of the virtuous man. Here's, here's what young men need to strive to be. Here's the kind of person a young woman needs to marry. Or as a husband, here's who I should be. Uh, as a wife, here's what 
I need to encourage when I see these things in my husband. Verse 1, Job says, I have made a covenant with my eyes. Why then should I look upon a young woman, someone who does not belong to him? In verse 5, he, he says, I, I have not walked with falsehood. In verse 9, he says, I have been sexually faithful to my wife in every way. In verse 13, he says, I, I've treated my servants fairly. In verse 16, he says, I, I've given attention to the poor, to the orphan. In verse 24, he says, I have been content with what I've had and not coveted. And we might think, well, easy for him to say he was wealthy. But uh, I guess we don't know if he was born into that wealth. I was going to assume that he worked for it. But, but either way, he was content with what he had. In verse 29, he had not sought revenge for his enemies or uh, been joyful even when his enemies suffered. And at the least we know he had the enemies of those who came and raided uh, his animals. And then verse 32, even, even something that might appear to be simple, but goes into the same class. He was you know, sexually faithful to his wife and he took care of the poor and he was hospitable, verse 32. He used his home and the things that he had to share with others, even those who were not his family. And so he just lays his life out and says, okay, guys, you, you've made these accusations. Here's what I know about myself. Do you know anything different? Have you heard anything different? And he's willing to lay the same before his God. And so today, uh, to be blameless and upright and God-fearing and evil shunning, we can compare ourselves in the same way. Uh, pornography is, is rampant throughout our society. People who tally the statistics and the numbers, it, it, por the pornography industry is bigger than the media. It's bigger than athletics. The amount of money that is poured into that and the amount of homes and lives that are, are destroyed is even greater than that numerical number. And all the statistics that are given by surveys and such say that it's, it's not something that just primarily plagues people who are atheists and agnostics, but people who say they read the Bible and believe in God, that pornography is something uh, that is common in a variety of ages, young and old. Job says, I've made a covenant with my eyes. What about lies? in our home, at our workplace, on our taxes. That's a, a common place. Job said, I have, if I've walked with falsehood, then I, I deserve to suffer. Walking blamelessly and upright means avoiding all forms of sexual immorality, all forms of fornication. And of course, that is before and during marriage. Uh, Satan has temptations in all of those relationships. In our relationships at work, when we know of genuine needs of those who are poor. Uh, we, we live in a, a time in our society where we constantly have access to more, but Job had learned to be content. I, I don't know that I've ever heard a commercial that encourages you to be content with what you have and, and don't add to your collection. There, there's a reason for that, and there's honorable business, of course, but my point is just where in society do we get the value of being content? Uh, it's not intended to come from the business community typically. And so we, we need a source for that kind of a reminder. Uh, we live in a world of, of hatred, hatred of others, hatred of other nations, and comp unhealthy competition of different sorts. Uh, Job kept himself from those. And then last he talked about hospitality. I want to encourage you and remind you of the opportunities that come to, with, to plant and water. Now, we, we can plant and water, invite friends to come and visit the ch church here when we assemble. And we can plant and water as we sing these songs and, and the Bible classes and such. Those are good opportunities. And so I'm not saying do this and not that or do that and not this. But I encourage you to think about the role of hospitality in, as being an opportunity to plant and to water. And without going into great detail, I'll, I'll just remind you of the, the Brooks family, maybe, since that's fresh on, on our minds, that there are just conversations you can have. There are questions people can ask in your home. 
across, across the dinner table that they can't ask in, in this context. Or maybe if they could, they wouldn't because there's too many people. And so there's some things that they can learn there in your home that they can't learn here. And maybe they can learn some things here. Some topics may come up that, that wouldn't come up across the dinner table. So it's not one or the other. It's not, well, don't invite people here, just have them into your home. Or don't worry about having them into your home, let's just get them here. It's, it's all of the above. But Job talked about hospitality. And think about that in, in regards to some of the other benefits. Think about the, the opportunities to plant and water when you'll open your time, open your home, or at a, at a park somewhere. It's not about the four, the four walls. But think about ways that, that God can use uh, hospitality in us. Job would have practiced such things uh, based on his life as described here. Job 38 through 41. I'm not even going to read any of it, but if, you're, if you have your Bible open, just, just turn and flip through that and your eyes may be drawn to some verse that you've noticed or some statement uh, that was made there. As God asked Job, well, you've, you've sure, uh, you've sure made, a, made a lot of assessments, Job, about uh, not only your innocence, but also about my justice. And so God says, if, if you think there's some things you don't understand... Well, then let me show you how many things you don't understand. And so God used this to humble Job, and it, it had that effect. But it, it's still an, an interesting section of Scripture to read. Uh, it, it also goes along with the song we sang a few minutes ago, How Great Thou, Thou Art. That, that's the impression that God was intending to make. And so from time to time, reading uh, these chapters, or some portion of them, uh, are simply another opportunity to be be humbled before our God, to be grateful for what God has done, and to be amazed, as we, as we sang a few minutes ago, uh, when I in awesome wonder consider. And that, that's what Job 38 to 41 is about, an opportunity to co consider and to wonder at the greatness of God. Then go to chapter 42 and read with me verses 1 through 6. Here was Job's response when God reminded him of how many things he truly did not understand or know. And Job answered the Lord and said, I, I know that you can do everything and that no purpose of yours can be withheld from you. You asked, who is this who hides counsel without knowledge? Therefore, I, I have uttered what I did not understand, things too wonderful for me which I did not know. And by wonderful there, he just means things too grand, not, not great and exciting, but things that are over my head. Listen, please, and let me speak, you said. I will question you, and you shall answer me. I have heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eyes seize you. Therefore, I abhor myself and repent in dust and ashes. A lot could be said about these verses, but I'll just point out what a beautiful confession uh, that he makes of regretting some of the things that he had said and of his willingness to repent for some of the things that he had said. Job uh, never lost his trust in God, but he, he charged God uh, too much with injustice or a failure to respond in the time and in the way that Job wanted him to respond. And so Job regretted that and repented of it and confessed that in these verses. Last, I want to uh, go through a, a, few, a few themes of the book of Job and, and base them on Deuteronomy 29, 29, obviously a very different context, but the first part of this verse is maybe a, a somewhat well-known statement. Moses wrote here, "...the secret things belong to the Lord our God, but those things which are revealed belong to us and to our children forever, that we may do the words of this law." Uh, those, those statements sit by, side by side. There, there are things that, God, that are secret that we cannot know. And though those belong to God. There are things that God has revealed. And the things that He has revealed put some responsibility upon us. We, uh, we, they are ours. He's given them to us in that general sense. In the book of Job, here are some things that are not... There's, there is no secret. 
The book of Job is written to teach us that God is just. Uh, the book of Job at first might seem to, to show the other side of that. It might, seem as, we might, it might make us wonder, well, is God just? Is God fair? Because after all, He sure let Satan do some horrible things to Job. And He did. But think about the fact that God limited what Satan could do. God put limits on what He allowed Satan to do. Also, we have to factor in among the things that we, we do know is that God also knew Job's faith. God knew where Job had been and where Job was. And He knew that, that Job would be equipped for everything that He permitted. And so how Satan could cause Job to suffer was limited. And the time in which it could happen was limited. And then at some point, God cut all of that off. And then we didn't turn and read it, but the end of the book of Job shows that God richly rewarded Job. Uh, Job, this, this was God's grace. This was God's mercy. He didn't have to do... To, he didn't owe Job anything. But he, he rewarded Job for his faith. And so yes, God, God is fair even in everything that He allowed here. God is just. James, James chapter 5 and verse 11 says it this way. James 5 and verse 11. Indeed, we count them blessed who endure. You have heard of the perseverance of Job and seen the end intended by the Lord, that the Lord is very compassionate and merciful. And so James maybe states something that's, that's obvious here, but by stating it, it makes it even more clear. Here's something that is revealed to us, that God is just, that God is compassionate, that God is merciful. Uh, God, God saw everything that happened to Job. There was no time that God turned away, forgot about, or ignored Job. Everything that was happening, God saw it and never abandoned him. Also in this, and I think this is James, James, the point of James, that by what happened to Job, God was also providing uh, for, for others, even literally thousands of years down to today, for you and I. Uh, Job got the message, this universe doesn't revolve around him. Do you ever get that idea, that subtle signal that the world doesn't revolve around you, that things that happen, uh, it may not matter what you think about why they are happening. God was providing for the faith of others in what He allowed. And so God uh, has earned our trust. Uh, we should not make the same mistake that Job did of unfairly and unjustly accusing God of being unfair and unjust. God is just. That is one of the themes of the book of Job. Also, of course, uh, we we'll probably talk about this from time to time, and maybe you have in, in the class uh, on Sunday of the nature of God, or probably will come up in the Wednesday study, is it reasonable to believe in God? Uh, the book of Job teaches us that good things happen to good people, and bad things happen to good people. And good things happen to bad people, and bad things happen to bad people. It's, it's a reality. And we, we struggle sometimes when those things happen, but we, we're wasting our life if we, for days and weeks and months and years, just fight against and, and just run the hamster wheel of why and, and don't accept the reality uh, that this is the nature of, of life. In Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verses 13 and 14, Solomon acknowledges this, this same point. He had noticed it. Whether this is an observation from uh, events in his own life or as a king, he would certainly know about a whole host of problems among his own people and maybe in other places. So he says, Consider the work of God, for who can make straight what He has made crooked? There are some things you can't change, so don't waste your heart and soul and mind and strength moaning over the fact that it didn't change. There's some things that you can't change. In the day of prosperity, be joyful. But in the day of adversity, consider. Surely God has appointed the one as well as the other 
so that man can find out nothing that will come after him. It doesn't mean that God sent every terrible thing that happens, but God created this world in a way so that, that, that it could happen. I'm sure Adam was frustrated with Eve, and Eve was frustrated with Adam maybe as well. Uh, in the joyful days, consider uh, in prosperity be joyful. And then when there is not prosperity, he says, consider. And if we can be like Job, if by faith we'll confess, uh, blessed be the name of the Lord in every circumstance, though the circumstance has changed and sometimes other people change, God hasn't changed. Blessed be the name of the Lord. If we could say like Job did in Job 42 and verse 2, uh, there is no purpose of yours that can you can do all things, God. And no purpose of yours can be withheld. Nobody can stop you from doing what, what you decide to do. And no one can make you act. Uh, but beyond that, beyond what I know, there are just some things that are too wonderful, too high, too deep. And I, I can't ever grasp those things. And so this doesn't necessarily make us feel better about what happens. But it's just reality that good and bad things happen to good and bad people. What, what's God's purpose when things happen? I'd say much of the time we, we don't know, except in 2 Timothy chapter 4, as James said of Job, that there was this intended end that God had in mind. Uh, I guess the big picture we could just say, when the good and bad things happen to good or bad people, then here's the end. Here's what, God's for God's part, uh, God hopes is the is the result. That at the end of our life, we could say like Paul did, I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. Finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day, and not to me only, but also to all those who have loved His appearing. If I can face the good and the bad of myself, and the good and bad it comes to others who are good and bad. Uh, if I can finish my life in such a way that I can say what, uh, what, what Paul did here, then that's the intended outcome. These are some things that we can know. The things that God has revealed belong to us. But then, of course, there are some other things. We, uh, there, there's always a combination of the secret things and the things that have been revealed. And so we're, we're all tantalized to think about, yeah, but why? Why did all these undesirable, why do all those bad things happen? And we, we just end up at the same place as Job. Uh, sometimes maybe we can explain. Sometimes it's, oh, because I did this. And so that's the result. Or, well, somebody else did this. And what, because of what they did, that's what happened to me. And then... Sometimes we just can't pin the tail on the donkey. Sometimes things are explainable, sometimes they are not. And we just need to have the faith that Job expressed in Job 42 again, where he said, look God, here's what I know. I know you can do all things, but I've learned you don't do all things. And I've learned you don't do all the things I want you to do. But there are things that are too wonderful for me which I cannot know. And when Job impeded on that ground, he eventually regretted it and had to repent of it. And sometimes I can't explain it. Sometimes it's a secret thing. Uh, that's, what, that's all that we can know. But even in the times such as this, where we have to wrestle with what we cannot know, God gives us some other things that we can know. Statements of assurance and comfort. Psalm 27 and verse 14. There's a, a song based on this. Wait on the Lord. Be of good courage and He shall strengthen your heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. When I don't know, here's what I do know. When I can't do anything, here's what I can do. Wait on the Lord. Psalm 30 and verse 5. His anger is but for a moment. His favor is for life. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. There's a song we sing based upon on that text. 
Ecclesiastes 3 reminds us there, there's a time, there's a season for everything in life. In Psalm 73, and verse 25, when, we, when the why pops into our mind, and we run on that hamster wheel for a while, and we don't end up anywhere different than where we were when we started, Psalm 73, beginning in verse 25, Whom have I in heaven but you? There is none upon the earth that I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Drop down to 28. But it is good for me to draw near to God. I have put my trust in the Lord God that I may declare all your works. When the undesirable things happen, at the least, they, they take us back if, if we're of this mind. Uh, they, they draw us nearer to God. Why, why do we have to have bad things happen to draw us nearer to God? I, I don't know, but they do, don't they? They draw us nearer to God in, in a way that is different. I mean, when things are well, doesn't mean we're not drawing near to God, but they draw us near to God in, in a different way. And then one more, Psalm 119 Verses 67 and 68. Psalm 119, 67. It says, Before I was afflicted, I went astray. But now I keep your word. You are good and do good. Teach me your statutes. And sometimes we, we learn what is good and we learn of the goodness of God when the undesirable things come. Is that why they come? Well, that, that may not be a satisfactory answer, but they come. But if, if we're going to ask the question, well, why do all these bad things happen to me? I, I'm, I'm a pretty good person. Well, we ought to also then ought to ask another question. Well, why do all the good things come? We, that, that's easier to, to... It's easy to neglect that. Well, because I like them to come. So, of course, why would I ask why? I like how it is. Well, but wait a minute. If I have to ask, why do I get all these bad things? It's a good question to ask. Why do I get all the good things that I do? I don't deserve all these bad things that happen. Maybe not. But do I deserve all the good things? If I'm honest, I think each of us can say, I, I have more than I deserve. I, I can't say I've earned what I have. That's equally worth considering. Why do we have the good things that we do? In James chapter 1 and verse 17, here's, here's the short answer. This was true of Job as it is today. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights. And so why do we have good things? Well, we, we can explain it at least this far. If we have good things, it's because there is a God uh, you couldn't do. Uh, you couldn't bring into your life every single good thing that you have. As we read this morning, Paul said, it's in Him that we live and move and have our being. Uh, you don't have your life uh, because you're, you're such a good person. But of course, sometimes good things happen and we can't explain other than uh, by the mercy of God, but there are times we have things and we realize it's more than we deserve. And we could say the same thing that Job did on those occasions. God, you can do everything, and you've done this. I, I don't know why, but I'll be thankful to you for it. But in those good days, it's also good to remember that the good things are as temporary as the bad days are. We're happy the bad days are temporary. And we're not so happy the good days are temporary. But they're both temporary, Ecclesiastes chapter 3. There's a time, there's a season for the good and the easy, just as there is for the difficult and the hard. The easy and the difficult remind us, that they at least give us something to compare to because we sing a song, How Beautiful Heaven Must Be. And we don't sing a song, but the counterpart to that is how terrible hell will be. How can we gauge in some way how terrible hell will be I don't know. Either take Job's worst day or take the worst day of your life 
and then compare hell in this way, it'll be far worse than that. And how good will heaven be? I, I don't think I have any words to describe it, but take Job's best day, I guess the end of the book of Job. I, I don't know, or maybe before all the tragedies happen, I have to ask him. Uh, but just take your best day, and heaven will be infinitely better than that. And so when you have good days, that's good, but don't become fixated and fo or focused or overly attached to trying to repeat those good days because they are temporary. They, they will not continue, but maybe they give us a, a measuring stick of sort to say, uh, however good this is, at whatever point it's lost, uh, heaven will be greater. Then last... Read with me 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 16 through 18. Uh, the good days give us opportunities to do what, what Paul says here as he closes the book, book of 1 Thessalonians. He makes just several uh, short, simple statements that maybe are, are, uh, are easy for us to carry with us. Verse 16, Rejoice always. Today and tomorrow... Undesirable, desirable, rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. Can you do that on both of those days? Pray without ceasing. Verse 18, And everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. There are secret things that belong to God, but the things that are revealed belong to us. And so take, take those with you this week. We're not told about the end uh, or in great detail of Job's life. Uh, I wonder what happened when Job died. I don't know if they had a, a public formal funeral like we did, a formal gathering where there was a speaker. Uh, but whether public or private, formal or informal, people would have talked about the life of Job, his, his life and his highs and his lows. We're, we're blessed uh, to be able to get acquainted with Job in some ways. And to see his faith, to see his faults, uh, to learn of his sorrows and to learn of his joys. Because regardless of how our lives detail to detail compare to his, uh, our, our lives share are going to share this, the same kind of challenges. Uh, joys or sorrows, things that will be given and, and things that will be taken away. What are you doing with your joys? And what are you doing with your sorrows? Take out your songbook. Turn to number 341. What are your greatest joys? What are your greatest sorrows? Uh, we sing this song to encourage you to reflect on both of those. And if your greatest sorrow is your sin that you're still guilty of, then know that your Redeemer lives and He has prepared a way and has prepared a plan for you to be forgiven of that. If you need to accept that offer that Jesus makes available to you tonight, knowing that Jesus is the Christ and knowing His will for you. Repent of your sorrow and confess your regret and confess His name and be baptized and He will wash away your sins and bring you uh, the, to the pinnacle uh, of your life and of your joys on this earth. And if we could share in that and help you in that, uh, that's why we're here. If as a Christian we can encourage you and stir you up in some way, and if not, let's speak, admonish, and teach each other as together we stand and sing.